Okay, welcome everybody to episode 50 of the Volatility Barometer. Not really a, you know, anniversary or anything, but 50 episodes, not too bad. I do have to say though, I'm uh, extremely tired today, so hopefully I'm not yawning through this whole thing. I actually uh, went out running today and there's a new building over the other direction. I've got a area mapped out. It's about 14 and a half kilometers. I typically do that maybe three times a week, four times a week, but I wanted to check out this new building and I can see it from my apartment. So I thought, oh, it can't be that far. It turned out to be quite a bit further than I thought. So I actually ended up running about 22 and a half kilometers today. So I am uh, quite tired, but cool building. I'm glad I went. I just probably shouldn't have done it on a live stream day. So I will spare, I'll try to switch to some type of screen share if I'm going to be yawning here. I don't want to make all of you as tired as I am, but yeah, enough of the pity party. Let's get started. I'm a professional. I can handle this. So thank you everybody for showing up. Of course, give the video a like for me. That really helps the algorithm a lot. Shout at me in the comments if the sound is not turned on correctly. Uh, it should be fine. I think I tested it beforehand. And just to recap what we've done recently, there was only one video this week, but I think it's a interesting one that I was basically explaining why the VTS portfolio is tax efficient. A lot of people think they have to choose between some type of buy and hold pie chart. You know, you see those things with all the diversified portfolio and you just let it sit there, but it can be traded in an IRA account. And then they think that, well, I can't at really active trade, so it's probably not worth it. The VTS portfolio is also fully tax efficient. All five of our strategies can also be traded in the same tax sheltered accounts. So uh, check that one out. One thing I do wanna point out though, just remember that oftentimes the questions everybody's asking will make its way onto the clips channel. So that's what all of these are. So the new clips for this week, since the last live stream last Friday, we did this one talking about um, you know, how volatility ETPs, a lot of people think they're manipulated, but they're, they're actually not. They function perfectly normal. They just tend to go down because they're insurance products. But this one, you can listen to me speak some Chinese. I did a little segment in a video talking about the importance of learning a second language. I do speak a little Chinese. So that one might be just, if nothing else, just fun to give it a quick listen. Uh, Bitcoin, we did another uh, myth buster, number four, this one here. We've also done a couple others part one, two, and three. I'll upload part five again. Nobody really watches my Bitcoin videos. Nobody really cares what I have to say. I actually own two Bitcoins, so I probably do own more than most people, but I'm actually quite negative on Bitcoin as well. So, you know, people don't typically care, but there it is. Uh, Law of large numbers, I like this one. You can check that one out. And then of course I was talking about the zero DTE phenomenon that we're seeing recently and whether that will actually cause a huge volatility spike. So just know that when you're asking your questions in the community live stream section, oftentimes these questions will be converted into little clips for everybody. So make sure you get your questions in. I will post these every Monday or Tuesday in the community tab of the YouTube channel. And you will probably want to uh, get your questions in because as I say quite often, it's actually pretty rare to have the opportunity to ask these questions. I mean, you can try, you can DM people on Twitter. I don't imagine they will uh, give you much response. So take advantage of this. I'm, you know, I'm willing to do this. I, I like doing them. We do it every week, live Q and A's. So make sure you do ask your questions, but let's get into the submitted questions first. That will give everybody an opportunity to throw some other questions in the comment section. And a little, a little later on, we will just do a lightning round. I'll get through as many of those as I can. So let's get started. There's actually several this week and some of them, I, I actually like doing this submitted thing for the first little, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes because it gives me a chance to look at it an hour beforehand. I can prepare any charts or anything that I need. So. You'll get better answers if you submit your questions here. But let's try to get through these. I will, again, I do tend to babble on, but let's try to rifle through this quickly. So I'll skip the formalities, but you know, for all of them, I, I do appreciate the kind words, but let's get right into the questions. So how often do you think it's necessary to update the median or range of the main volatility metrics? For example, let's say VIX that had some big spike re during recent years, do you periodically check that its median did not significantly move from the long-term median that is reference for the calculation of your model? 
So the first thing that stands out is we don't actually use the median specifically. What we are typically doing is using a whole range of volatility metrics. Median is on here. Like I like to show people, for example, our volatility barometer. The median is 44%. Right now it's at 52, so it's slightly above average. A little bit elevated volatility right now. But the median isn't necessarily used for any of our strategies. We typically, um, they're all different levels and different strategies use a different combination of all the metrics. So it's a lot more complicated than that. But your question is essentially, if you do have some type of volatility environment where things have been changing, like recently, starting in say, Volpocalypse 2018, you've got the COVID in 2020, 2022 was a terrible year. So we do have some input variables that are perhaps elevated compared to say 2010 to 2018. So question is, do I go back and change all of these and adjust? Well, it turns out that I think it's actually quite convenient that the VIX futures launched in March of 2004. And the reason I say it's convenient is because that time period from about 2004, 2005, up until now, is what I would consider a very consistent volatility regime. So if we did happen to have really robust volatility metrics going back further than that, we don't actually, about mid 2000s is really where the good data starts to come. But let's say we had some really good stuff for 1980. I probably wouldn't use it because the Fed is making different decisions in the last 20 years than they maybe previously did. The government, more debt, more fiscal policy, more political gridlock. The market is different now than it was in the 70s and 80s. So even if we had that data, I would either not use it at all, or I would probably design some type of rolling system where I'm using maybe 80% of the most recent 20 years and then maybe throw in 20% of the previous stuff just, just because. But I actually find it quite convenient that we've got a pretty solid 20 year period of volatility data and I use it all basically equal weighted. So 2023 will happen at the end of the year. We're just adding another year to what we currently do, but I'm not using any recency metrics. I'm not sort of using a, a like a weighted average scale or anything. I like to try to get as many bull market and bear market periods in my data set as possible, given that the underlying market macro is about the same. And I think mid 2000s until today, it's kind of all a blur. It's kind of all the same thing, just political shenanigans and debt and all the things that you know we complain about quite often here so i think that that kind of answers your question no i don't really adjust if 2023 is a very good year or very bad year it's just another year added to the data set i won't i won't do anything specific with that it's it just it is what it is second question there's two here why do you prefer to use essentially long only strategies Exception made for rare long vol trade. In times of market crashes, you usually stay in cash and not take an even small short position. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. We don't actually short equities in any of our strategies. And like you said, there is the rare exception for long vol. So maybe two to 3% of the time, one of our strategies will take long vol positions. But I pulled up a couple of articles that I've done in the past that will illustrate this really well. So the first one, is this one where I talked about what would happen if we shorted the S&P instead of buy long gold in one of our strategies called tactical balanced. So this strategy down here called tactical balanced, this is today's email, by the way, um, you can see that one of the positions is gold. And this is for extreme high volatility readings. When the market is crashing, it looks like a pretty big chunk here, but you got to remember that my metrics go from zero to hundred percent on this dial but they almost never go above 90%. So it might look big, but this is actually only about a 10% sliver dedicated to the potential for gold. So why wouldn't I short the S&P? Clearly volatility metrics are elevated. Wouldn't that be an awesome time to short the market is essentially the question. Well, I went into this article showing that if I were to have done that, you can see gold did well for me in my strategy since 2012. This is back tested before 2012, but I started in 2012 performed quite well, but short the S&P 500 did horribly. It's actually negative performer. There's actually a very specific reason for that, but I'll pull up another thing that I did. This video here called short S&P 500 during VIX futures backwardation. This actually reminds me. Um, 
I was in Vancouver during this. I was standing on the balcony of my hotel, shot about five or six videos. Kind of missed this actually, looking at it. You can see this path right here. I'm going off on a tangent, but that's fine. This path right here, I used to love running there. I don't know if you can um, picture what Vancouver looks like. Let's do a Google map here. I'm, I'm currently in Dubai, you can see the palm there. But uh, Vancouver, let's check out Vancouver. This is essentially, whole greater Vancouver is massive, but Vancouver is basically this. So I was actually standing on the balcony of this hotel when I was shooting those videos, the Western Bayshore, love this place. I would go outside of my balcony and I would run the entire seawall. Stanley Park is just a beautiful place, right on the ocean, unbelievable views. And in Vancouver, I used to do it at about six in the morning. So I'd see the sunrise every day, go past the beach over here. I'd run all the way down here. This is Yale Town, Granville. I'd go past there, go to the science world. And then right here, for anybody who's actually been to Vancouver, this is the sketchy part. There's a part of the town called Hastings. I'm sure you've actually heard of the name before, but I actually had to dart through about five or six blocks of a really sketchy part of town. Like, you know, not to be discompassionate or whatever, but you know, tent village, a lot of drug action down there. Hastings is really, really bad. So you got your head on a swivel. I'd go about five blocks through the nasty part and then I'd get back to the Pan Pacific and I'd run back home. And this whole thing's about 17 kilometers. So, um, Really, really good little running path there for me. But let me get back to what I was saying. So essentially, this video is showing what would happen if the S&P 500 was shorted during VIX futures backwardation. And again, remember, VIX futures backwardation should be a time when a lot of people would say, yeah, that's, you should short the market, right? Volatility is very elevated. It only happens on about 14 to 16% of trading days. This is actually what happens. Again, negative. That's the same shape of the curve, right? Why is this happening? Well, the reason it's happening, there's actually two reasons. And I named these, this is not like some official name, but the first reason I call it the slow bleed. And what the slow bleed means is that if you imagine what's happening, when volatility metrics get very elevated, that's the time that you would be jumping into this short S&P 500 position. But oftentimes, unless the market completely falls off a cliff and goes right into a COVID or Volpocalypse event, probably that's also right about the time that the market's gonna recover. It doesn't always crash off the cliff, right? European debt crisis, you might've ridden it a little longer. Q4 2018, but these are very rare. Most of the time, when we get into that deep backwardation, the market's gonna recover any day now, right? So what you end up doing is you're just walking into these whipsaw events where there are little paper cuts along the way, but it really, really does start to add up. So that's what I call the slow bleed when you get just constantly hit with that. And then the other thing I call, again, this is just my silly name that I gave it, but I call it the dreaded give back. The second aspect of why this sucks so bad is you can imagine, let's say you really do get one of these awesome spikes, like this is the financial crisis, this is the uh, European debt crisis, 2011, COVID. You can actually ride short S&P if you get one of those really serious crises. But again, imagine what's going to happen. One of the issues with shorting the market or going long volatility is that those metrics can stay sticky, is what I call them. They can stay very elevated in the 98, 99th percentile for several days or maybe a couple of weeks after the market has already recovered. So the same signals that get you into the short S&P position and you ride it for a little while and you think you're a genius, that's the same signals that keep you in the trade long after the market has already recovered. So you end up again giving back some or perhaps even all of the gains that you, you made over again, plus the dreaded give back, turns out Shorting the stock market is extremely difficult and there's really no way to do it. It doesn't really matter how, let's say you only do it 10% of the time, only 5% of the time. It's still the same thing. Most of the time you're walking into whipsaw. So what we do instead with our strategies is I would just prefer to sidestep the crisis rather than risk losing money during a crisis. The last thing in the world you wanna do is lose money when you could have just sidestepped to cash. So we go to utilities or cash, totally fine. We're not gonna profit from a market crash with this strategy. It's never gonna make money during a crash, unless utilities do, which it has in the past. So it's not never, but it's not the actual purpose. 
Second strategy, gold actually can do well in a crisis. So this one might actually make some money. This one here, there is a long volatility position. But you notice there is no short S&P. And that is the basic reason that essentially you're just walking into a problem there. I would much rather either remain in cash or actually there are ways to benefit. But if you look at my long-term track record for the portfolio for 11 years, um, the only time volatility metrics has ever really let us down was the first, say, three months of 2022. That, that was not fun at all. Volatility didn't spike early last year. So there really wasn't a way to cycle out into safety. But most of the other times, I would rather just not get killed, right? European debt crisis, I did fine. Here, this is only like a 6% drawdown in the, um, the 2015 China scare. Fall apocalypse, we lost nothing. Um, Q4 2018, market was down 20%. We lost nothing. COVID, we lost nothing. I mean, we were in cash during COVID. That's the point. I would much rather just be the type of investor that either does well or tries to sidestep. I don't want to be walking into those constant headwinds of shorting the S&P. It's, it sounds like a really good idea, right? I mean, I'll just wait for the market to crash and then I'll ride this wave and make a bunch of money. But slow bleed plus dreaded give back, you're probably not going to make any money. It's shorting the market is, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, not a wise position to take. So that's why we don't do it. Like you said, the occasional long vol, it can work, but two to 3% of the time only. Otherwise, not losing money is also a win in a market crash. Don't ever forget that. There's nothing wrong with cash. Okay, next question. I follow the VTS portfolio and will be off grid with no internet for a month from mid-February to mid-March. What do you recommend for someone who won't be able to cycle in and out of positions for an extended period? So I like this question as well. And uh, one of the reasons is I get to highlight one of my pet peeves in the industry is, let me know if this chart here reminds you of something. Essentially what it is, start with $10,000, you invest in the S&P 500. This is a 40 year time horizon. If you invest in all days, basically buy and hold, and there's a million variations of this. Financial advisors love this chart. They love flashing this chart. But if you miss just five of the best days in the S&P 500, you lose 40% of your money, right? If you miss the best 10 days, you're down over half your money. And so what the reason they like to flash these charts is imagine what's happening when you get a crisis, clients are losing money hand over fist, right? They're down 20, 30, 40%. Everybody's panicking. They want to leave, but the financial advisor doesn't get paid if you leave. So you have to stay. Well, how do they get you to stay? They tell you, hang on, the market could recover here. And if you miss just five bad day, five good days, you could lose half your money. And it, it actually kind of makes sense for people. And they're like, yeah, I, I can see the data there. I, I don't want to miss the best five days. What if it recovers? Uh, the problem, of course, is that you're ultra cherry picking, like the five best days, even if it does recover, there's gonna be down days in that as well. You're not missing the five best days, you might be missing 5% or 10% of a recovery. It really doesn't matter. And I'm gonna show you exactly why it doesn't matter. So the first thing that I will say though, is one of the power of my portfolio is like I said, the ability to be nimble and navigate the strategies. So if you're ever in a position that you can't do that, then all of a sudden, this is just a buy and hold portfolio, right? Like right now we are in the NASDAQ, the Dow, the S&P and one iron condor. If you are not available to navigate out, then there's no power to this portfolio at all. It is just a buy and hold equities portfolio. Might do great the next month. Come back after your vacation, you're happy you left everything. But let's say something terrible happens today. Like right now, what's the market at? It's down 80.8. Let's say it's bad enough that on Monday we have to cycle out. We can actually move from full on equities into full on cash in all of our strategies in one day. That's the power of VTS. That's why I've been able to navigate this, you know, these crashes over the years. So if you can't do that, then you'd need to go to cash. That's just the, sh the straight up answer is you need to go to cash, enjoy your vacation. That's what you do but I can actually show you how insignificant this is. So this is a compound interest calculator. Person starts with 25 grand, they make 12% a year. Very ambitious for buy and hold people, typically I say about seven, but again, our portfolio is about 22. So let's 
split somewhere near there and just say 12%. It doesn't really matter. 25% capital gains and you add 1,000. This person at the end of 30 years has $1.73 million. This person is going to do the exact same four inputs. And this person also has the exact same of money. So you can see no difference between these two people. Well, what happens if this person skips a little bit of this performance? How much of a difference is that really going to make? So what I've got here is all the performance of VTS. We've been going for over 11 years now. This is the monthly distribution. You can see the 50th percentile is 1.97% a month. It's basically on an average month, that's what we're making, just under 2% a month. So we are actually coming off a really good month in January. We were up over 5%. So there might be some diminishing returns. It's probably not expecting an above median. So let's go ahead and use that middle number. I mean, it's certainly possible that, you know, February to March is a, just a killer period and it might be three or 4%, but let's see what happens if you just skip two of these, right? So we're going to update this chart and you let me know if this is destruction, if that is devastating. I've already updated it. So that's the difference can't even see the blue line behind there. Essentially the difference, you're going to lose $3,000. So instead of being at 1.733 million, like this person, you would be at 1.73 million. You lose 0.16% of your portfolio. That is a long ways away from what they're telling you. If you skip the best 10 days and cherry pick the ultra, you know, over a 40 year period, you pull out the best 10 days. Obviously that's going to be an insane difference in performance but we're not talking about pulling out the five best or 10 best. We're talking about skipping a month, skip two months, skip this. What difference does that really make long-term? Not a whole lot. I can kind of start to see a blue line there. You know, now you're going to lose $12,000, still less than 1% of your portfolio. Let's say, I mean, let's make it really crazy. VTS is obviously profitable, so I wouldn't want you skipping too much of the performance, but let's say you decided for some reason you're going to skip what would be equivalent of a year. Still gonna have $1.69 million. Yeah, you lost 40 grand, and yes, you're slightly dipping below, but it's really about finding something that works long-term and being consistent with it. And like I said, the power of our portfolio is how nimble we can be, and we can cycle out into a way better portfolio on Monday than we are in Friday if it's crashing. So move to cash, enjoy your vacation, no problem. And to go a step further, definitely email me and let me know you're leaving and uh, tell me your email address so I know who you are and I'll refund your subscription for the time that you're gone. It's completely fine. You don't have to feel this pressure to stay invested in the market. My portfolio doesn't work that way. I, I don't need to basically lie or heavily lean on you and coerce you into staying. It's fine. You want to take a month off, you take a month off. It's, you know, even if you get extremely unlucky and February happens to be the best month I've had in years, it might cost you 1% of your long term. It's not going to be like that chart was showing, like you're going to be alarming. You're going to lose half your money if you do this. It's, it's not at all. Don't, don't worry about it. So enjoy your vacation. No problem at all. Being off grid is fine, but absolutely go to cash because you, you, you know, you have to be there to cycle out if something terrible happens. You never know. Okay. Another question coming to mind just right now. What do you think about shorting vol by going long out of the money put? Okay. So this is a good question. Again, what you will want to do. I like to reference my past work if it's really relevant. And in this case, it absolutely is. So go to the website, go to, or sorry, the YouTube channel type in what's called stock replacement. And what you'll find is I've actually done two videos on this. Stock replacement is an option strategy that allows you to replicate a stock or ETF by using an option, essentially a long put option, exactly like you mentioned. First video here talks about what it is, why it's a powerful strategy and why you should definitely learn how to do it. And then this other one shows a live trading example for shorting the VXX with a long put option. And essentially what it would look like is if you go over here and you go to the VXX, what I like to do, so I'll give you a couple of little rapid fire tips here, but you definitely wanna watch that, you know, it's only 20 minute, two part video series. You'll want to watch that for sure. 
Is my internet down? No, there it goes. Okay, so the first thing is I like to go over 100 days. So this 133, this is gonna be good for us. You wanna go down. You said out of the money puts. That's the first part that I'm gonna disagree with. You said an OTM put right there. What you really wanna do is do in the money. You can see the VXX right here. It's trading at about 1160. If you do out of the money, let's say you do this nine, this delta right there, the D delta, you can see it's 0.18. This is not a one-to-one -one ratio, but essentially what that means is you will be capturing roughly 0.18%, about 20% of the movement of the VXX. So if the VXX goes down 5%, you might only capture about 1% of that. What you actually want to do is do deep in the money puts. You wanna make sure that your delta is as high as possible where there is still volume on those strikes. So, I mean, uh, volatility ETP volumes don't work exactly like stocks do. It Sometimes it might look like it's low, but it's actually okay still. Uh, but let's say you did something like the 18 or even the 16, talking about a 64 delta. Now you can capture 65% of the underlying VXX with an option. If you were to do UVXY, for example, you would do the same thing. You would make sure you're going 130 days out. 100 or more is fine. And again, you can go deep. UVXY doesn't get the strong delta as much, but remember it's 1.5 times leverage, so it's a little different. But let's say you did the 12. A 60 delta of a 1.5 leveraged product, that's gonna be also pretty good. You want to definitely go in the money. And then if you're gonna hold this position open for a long period of time, let's say the market's super advantageous and it's gonna be open for a month straight, then once it gets inside 100 days, you're gonna to wanna to close it and you're gonna wanna immediately roll it to a further out month, 130, 140 days, and just rinse repeat. But that's a very, very good way to short volatility. Um, and definitely watch those videos because I demonstrate that when you're holding a long put option, it's actually a lot safer. The maximum loss is far, far less than the typical short volatility position, but you can still capitalize on the downward trend that we've all seen for the VXX, UVXY. They do go down. Um, yeah, in the money, not out of the money. But yes, very good question. All right, moving along. I need coffee, I'm tired. Shouldn't drink coffee at 10.30 at night, but it is what it is. Okay, regarding the option strategy. Okay, so yeah, I made a mental note. This is last week he was asking about calendars, but anyway. Do you consider the historical HV, his, historical volatility, against the implied volatility when you enter a trade, like the VRP in the SPY? For instance, when the 22 day HV is greater than the IV, you pass the trade. So, short answer yes. Volatility risk premium is important. It is one of our metrics. You can see I do simple VRP, which it's only there for, you know, basically so people can get this article. Everything you see in blue in my daily emails has articles and videos attached to it. But simple VRP, it's essentially in our dashboard just so I can show people. But the real one is the trader's VRP. So I'll show you what I mean by that. VRP, for anybody who doesn't know, is essentially implied volatility minus realized volatility. So the VIX index is a 30 day forward implied volatility, but it's a calendar measure. So it's basically counting all the days. There's 21 trading days in a month on average. So it's essentially a 21 day implied volatility minus the 20 day historical volatility. Close enough, this is what's called the volatility risk premium. And the theory goes that because forward looking is more uncertain, of course, traders are gonna to need to get paid a little bit of a premium to be taking on future trades. So the implied volatility in a calm market should probably be higher than the historical realized volatility because that's the way that volatility should work in a calm market. So that would be a good signal to take trades, right? But what I do is I go a little bit further, I design my own VRP, which I call the trader's VRP, which is much more specific to what I'm actually doing here. So. I actually show people exactly how to calculate it. If you want it, it's there, it's there, and then it's here as well. You can actually calculate it yourself, but what it essentially is, is a slight variation. So it's a five day weighted moving average of the VX30, not the VIX. The VX30 is the constant rolling 30 day maturity of the front two months of the VIX futures. So I like to use that because it's far more specific to volatility products. And then we're gonna subtract a rolling five day, and the trader's VRP 
is really good because it's basically a signal for risk on, risk off. It's essentially what you're getting at here. So you can see if it's above zero, what is it right now today? Above zero, it's 1.66. So no real reason not to be in the market with equities right now, basically. And we are, we're in the NASDAQ, the Dow and the S&P 500. But if the trader's VRP dips below zero, that's definitely a warning sign that the market is showing signs of weakness. So you might want to exit to cash or use it in combination with multiple other indexes but or metrics. But you can see I did a super simple test, just proof of concept basically here, where just using that one single metric, just the trader's VRP and nothing else, if it's above zero, you're long the SPY, and if it's below zero, you're in cash. So 87% of the time you'd be in the trade, S&P 500, and 13% of the time you'd be in cash. Buy and hold is here. Using that simple one metric filter, you can actually improve the performance substantially. I mean, it might not seem like much, but the difference between 8.3 and 9.5, it's about 15% difference. That's significant. And also the drawdown goes from 55 for buy and hold down to 37 for using that one single filter. Now, of course, for me, we use tons of filters. I use you know, the volatility barometer uses about 13 different filters. So we can do far better than this. It's just a proof of concept. But the point is that, yes, this is actually a very good signal. And when the VRP dips negative, it is a sign that there's something maybe fundamentally wrong or at the very least dangerous with the current market. You know, a lot of people, no rational investor can watch their net worth go down 55% and still stay the course. It's just absurd. This is why I always tell people, no rational investor just holds 100% of their net worth in the stock market. Nobody can watch half their money disappear and they can just go to sleep and wake up the next day and continue the process. They will absolutely capitulate and they will leave, right? So at least getting it to 37 is moving in the right direction. But uh, to answer your question there, where is our, there it is. Yes, absolutely. VRP is a great signal. It's not my favorite. You know, if I had to rank them, obviously the barometer is by far the best. Number two is the cash fix oscillator, but traders VRP is, is definitely a good signal. So yes, good question. And also remember to read article 557, or no, which one is it? Article 572 on the website. Make sure you Google for VRP right in the search bar of my website. Go to my blog, go to the search bar. Article 572 is the one you're looking for. Of course, for VTS members, they can get all the articles and videos for all of the blue links that you see, but um, you know, cheat code a little bit. If you don't pay me any money, you can actually still see this article. So go ahead and do that. There it is. All right, moving on. We're, I think we're doing well today. I gotta speed up here, sorry about that. What is realistic to expect trading options full-time the way you do in part of your private portfolio? Compound, uh, CAGR, sharp, drawdown, winning months. So interesting question. How would I answer it? What is realistic for a normal person? You know, just being perfectly honest, zero, right? I mean, the probably way more than half of people are negative with their trading. So what is realistic for an average person? Zero would be good. I don't know what percentage of option traders actually make any money, but it's probably 20%-ish. I don't know if there's any data to support that, but can't be very high. So zero, I suppose, but I can show you what I do. And then maybe you can get kind of a ballpark from there. Let me close some of these windows. I've got so much open. I tend to do that. Um, so my VTS options portfolio since we launched is up about 18% a year, give or take. Now this does exclude VTS options. I'll get to that in a second. But um, yeah, like this is my iron condors, butterflies, earnings trades, wheel of fun, pretty much everything I do, directional flies, term structure pairs, all of that stuff. It's all included in this track record. It's about 18% a year, uh, max drawdown about 13%, something like that. And then, like I said, I've got my specialty, basically my flagship option strategy, VIX options. Um, I always remove it because it's extremely active. It's very dynamic, like, you know, sometimes as many as 20 or 30 trades a month. It's not so easy to do this, but um, I will be teaching it to everybody in the, in the new course. But I always separate this because it's, it's far more involved than all the other ones. Like an iron condor strategy might be a couple trades a month. This one is uh, pretty involved. But uh, yeah, 24% for this one. So I would say somewhere in that range, I would say you're looking at somewhere between 0% for someone who's 
doesn't really know what they're doing. They're just an average trader. Investing is really difficult, as you know, and most people lose money if they try to do it themselves. Uh, but I would say that that is about representative. I'm, I'm at about 23%, but I do have to be fair. I'm the person who is always preaching that the next 25 years of the S&P will probably be lower than the previous 25 years. I happen to believe investing is going to get harder going forward, a lot harder, given the debt, given the political environment. I think trading is just going to get harder and harder every year. So if I'm saying that, look, stocks and bonds are in for a rough go the next 25 years compared to the previous, I should probably be fair to myself and say I probably won't make 22% a year either. So if you were to offer me 15% a year for the next 20 years, I'm in. Deal. Like, I'll shake on that right now. I'll take 15% right now. I know that there's people on Twitter that talk about you'll double your account in a year and you'll get these astronomical returns. It's all... It, it, no, it, it's all lies. Get, getting 15% a year is a phenomenal rate of return. You just, depending on who you ask and, and it, whether they're a serious person or not, whether they're an actual serious investor, uh, you will never hear somebody who's actually in the trenches trading, has 10, 15 years of experience, manages capital for other people. You'll never hear those people talking about annual rates of return higher than, say, you know, very high end 20, 25%, but that would be world, world class. So um, let's be fair to myself. I've done well. I'm at about 23. Like I said, I'll take 15 right now. So use that as your benchmark. 15 is really, really good. Um, and, and I don't mind saying that. Anybody who asks me, I don't mind saying that. 15% a year is awesome. If you can do that, um, you would have a very strong career in asset management if you could produce 15% a year. Um, okay, let's move on. Oh, I missed this one. When did you get profitable in your trading career? Um, that question's not super relevant because I actually started in 2005 and I like, let's be honest, that was probably a quite an easy year to start a career on 2005, 2006, nothing really happened. So, um, I was profitable right away. Perhaps if I started in 2008, 2009, you know, maybe I would have got hit with some unexpected things because all new people, they, they have a million blind spots. They don't see things that, you know, in hindsight, you're like, I can't believe I didn't know that. Uh, we have to make those mistakes as we go. And, and I've made them all, believe me. I've been doing this for 17 years. But yeah, I was profitable right away. Let's call it luck of the draw. I happened to have two good years before, um, before my skills really started to be tested. How did you learn trading? Courses, books, mentor. So I'm always a bad person to ask because I've actually not done any of those things. I'm entirely self-taught, trial and error, traded live capital full-time from 2005 to 2011, just figured it out myself. Um, you know, I don't really have any, I might've read a couple of books. I think I read, I think I read Options, Volatility and Pricing, Sheldon Nadenberg, um, I might have read one called, God, this was years ago. I might have read Options as a Strategic Investment, I think it was called. I don't even ask. Uh, Macmillan kind of rings a bell. I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't really read books. I don't have, I've never had a mentor, never had courses. Same thing with my professional golf career. I never had a coach. I just figured it all myself. But what I will say is that is not smart. I mean, you have to understand that I'm... I'm kind of old, <laughs> old and washed, I always say. I'm 47 years old. The internet was different when I started trading in 2005. If I had to do it over again, I would absolutely lean on all the stuff that is available to people in 2023. Like 2005, it wasn't like you just go online and you get trading courses and you have a thousand to choose from. It was a totally different environment. So I learned what I needed to learn in 17 years of trading. But if you do it right and you navigate correctly and you know the sources to lean on and you search, search and seek out serious people, then you could accelerate that dramatically, right? You could take a couple of courses. I mean, I would definitely suggest doing that. As you know, I'm putting together an options course. This is super self-serving to say, but I think it's going to be awesome. And I think everybody should buy it. I really do. Let's say it costs $2,000. The thing that always kind of bothers me is that people... They don't understand that delayed gratification is one of the skills you need to succeed in life, right? In all aspects of life, you can't look at the upfront anything. You have to look at, okay, what is this going to get me going forward? You know, spend $2,000 for an option course. If that course gets you 
a little bit of an accelerated learning curve. Maybe you can make an extra one or 2% a year on your rate of return because you learned a few valuable lessons. And maybe those lessons were things not to do, not always things to do. Sometimes learning things not to do is how you get an extra 1%. 1% compounded over time, over 20 years, can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you have a significant capital base, it could be a million dollars. Seriously, like one or 2% compounded is a lot of money if you've got capital adding to your trading account. And so people look at it like, well, oh, I don't wanna pay $2,000 for a course. Okay, I mean, I, if that's your attitude in life, that's fine, but people will pay fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to go to university and get a degree and probably not boost their income a whole lot. And yet they'll shy away from a $2,000 option course, right? They'll pay that for a new iPhone, no problem at all, but they won't actually see that, oh, I see what's going on. I can use this education to accelerate my learning curve and 15 years from now, I will be infinitely better off, right? They don't really see it that way. So what I would recommend, not only should you buy, this is dangerously close to like self-promotion, which I don't like to do on my own live streams. But what I would recommend you do is buy my course when it's out there. And then next year, buy someone else's course. Go out there, do your due diligence, find a serious person who, look, you, I mean, the problem with the internet as well is it's a double-edged sword. Just there is some good information, but there's also... 99% frauds now and everybody trying to pile in and capitalize. So make sure the people you're following, it's f really obvious they're giving 80 to 90% of their work for free. Find a serious person, take their course next year. And then in 2025, spend another $2,000 and take a third person's course. Think of how far ahead you would be if you learned from three investors with 10 to 15 to 20 years of experience you would be so much further ahead and you wouldn't have to do it the way that I did. You wouldn't have to be that self-taught, like I'll figure it out as I go. I'll suffer all the financial mistakes that I made. You don't need to do any of that. So yeah, that's what I would say. Now, obviously that is um, self-promotion because I do charge money for my services as well. But yeah, absolutely. And maybe we'll take it together. Like I don't know everything either. Maybe next year when I have more time on my hands, maybe I will do that due diligence myself. I will find a couple of people and I'll say, that looks really interesting. Maybe the whole community should do it. I'll pay, of course, for my course and I'll do the course. I'll say next April, I'm going to be spending the next three months taking XYZ person's course. Who wants to join me, right? Maybe I'll learn a thing or two from that other person as well. So maybe I'll start a YouTube little mini series where I buy courses, I do them, and I come back and report on them. And I wouldn't do it for the sake of, you know, dunking on everybody, but I would legitimately try to find people who do good work. And that's what I would recommend you do. So I am unfortunately not a great person to ask this question. Um, as far as the three ranking them, courses are by far the best. One of the reasons I've never written a book, I mean, I, I've read, I've written, I mean, I could write 10 books. I could condense my work into 10 books if I wanted. But I just don't think books are really, you get your bang for your buck. I think that it's a lot of time spent and there isn't a whole lot of information there. I think like a 50 video course or 75 video course is gonna be just way stronger overall. And then mentorship, I would just flat out say, don't ever pay any money for mentorship. The whole one-on-one -on -one coaching stuff, you're gonna spend a fortune doing that and it's gonna be extremely inefficient. I know that they're able to sell it, like you need a coach, you need a mentor, you're gonna be having an expert trader looking over your shoulder, helping you out. I know that the marketing is easy, but you're gonna be paying so much money. Can you imagine that? you know, you'll, you'll spend five or $10,000 and you'll feel you barely got started versus a course. It's all there for you. It's put together. You can go back and refer to it for years to come. And, you know, like I've said before, my course isn't even launched yet. And I've already told people about it, but for mine, it's not one of those like buy the gold, then buy the platinum, then keep going. And, oh, this one leads to that one. And I have a new strategy, that one. It's a one-time thing. You buy it once, you're a member for life. Every time I add a new strategy, I'm gonna give it to you for free. I'm not really gonna do that money grab like I've got five different courses and you have to buy all five of them and it's a tease to get you to the next one. I won't do that to anybody, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. I've not really done the book thing. Mentoring is garbage. And uh, leverage 2023, there is a lot of good, useful tools out there. You don't have to be like me. You know, golf was the same. Never had a golf coach, never had a sports psychologist. Became, a, you know, the top ranked player in Canada and I turned professional, played for five years. 
who knows how much better I would have done if I actually did it correctly. So um, it is what it is. Ah, getting sleepy. All right. This is a good one too. I'm unclear about the pricing of VXX. On the third Wednesday of the month, the VIX expires. Correct. Not always the third Wednesday, just this is really nitpicking, but what it actually is, is it expires exactly 30 days before the following month's S&P 500 options expiration. So if there happens to be some holidays that fall on a weird day, then it's not always the third Wednesday. But just as a general rule, yes, third Wednesday, that's fine. It's the vast majority of the time that's going to be true. Uh, recently, the VIX has been in the low 20s. What is it right now? VIX right now is 1922. Correct. The VIX has been in contango. Also correct. So the futures months are higher than the spot VIX. Okay. So again, I'm going to unpack a little bit of this as we go, but you've said two things there. One of them's important. One of them isn't. So you mentioned contango. Contango happens. This is the VIX futures term structure, by the way, vixcentral.com. Bookmark this. You need to have this website. It's just a quick glance at the VIX futures. Contango is when this second month is higher than the first month. That's what contango is. Right now it's at 4.3%. A lot of people reference it because it's easy and they can look at it and they can say, oh, contango, and they can sound really smart. But the truth is contango is totally relevant for the movement to the volatility products. There is no buy high, sell low dynamic. In fact, if you go on my website, again, there's a video for everything. I've done this for years. I've done a full video debunking the whole buy high, sell low. So contango means nothing. But the second thing that you mentioned, futures being higher than the spot VIX, that is critical. So essentially, when these two futures are above this, which is the VIX index, that's called roll yield. And when there's positive roll yield, that's important. Moving on, the VXX is expected to gradually transition from the first month until the expiration date. It is supposed to consist of 100% the second month future. Also correct. So right now there's 11 days to go. The VXX, the UVXY, the new UVIX, the old TVIX, all of these products, SVXY, they're all being priced based on a combination, what we call the constant maturity, basically the VX30. It is a combination based on the number of days to expiration of these front two VIX futures. And that's essentially what's causing, not causing, but pricing the movement of the volatility ETFs. So yes, right now it's somewhere in the middle. It's probably right about there. On the first day of the next cycle, it'll be 100% the front month, and then it'll gradually move to the back month and it'll repeat the cycle. So you all get the point. Okay, here's the meat of the question. I noticed on expiration date, the VXX was about 12. Why isn't the VXX in the low 20s like the VIX and the VIX futures month? So does everybody understand what he's asking? The VXX right now is trading at 1164. The VIX is 19 and the front month VIX future is 20. How is it possible that if the VXX, as we say, nearly exactly tracks the front two months of the VIX futures, how is it that there is such a price decoupling from these two things? Okay, so the essentially the answer is the price of the VXX is completely irrelevant. So if it says 1164, that number means nothing. The VXX at certain times might say 70. It might say seven. It might say 150 if we're in a real crisis. It could reverse split and it could go from seven or eight right back up to 80. The price of the VXX means nothing. You're talking about relative changes. So you can see the percentage change is 3.66 right now. That's how much it is up. Is that real? Is the market crashing today? Oh, it's down 1%. Okay. Anyway, it's up 3.66%. The VXX is essentially tracking an index, not the price of the VXX, the relative movements of the VXX. So if this index, say, goes up 4% on Monday, then the VXX should go up roughly 4% on Monday. The UVXY, because it's a 1.5 times leverage product, it should go up 1.5% on Monday. UVIX is two times. It should go up, you know, double, 8% on Monday. It's the relative changes, not the price of it. So when you say the VXX is 12, but the, the VIX is 20, 
that doesn't matter. Sometimes you'll look at it and the VIX futures will be 15 and the VXX will be 60. Sometimes it'll be just totally decoupled. But remember, all that we care about is what is happening with the VX30. If it's going up, then the VXX is also going up. If it's going down, the VXX is going down. If this index, and there's indexes for all of them, there's indexes for the old one times inverse, you can look at that one as well. They've got really complicated names, but if you ever want, just shoot me an email, I'll let you know what they are. This one is the SPVIX SPIT. This is the inverse, you can see. So obviously SVXY has done well this year, like in the last six months or so, it's done really well. If this is going up, so is the SVXY, regardless of price. Price doesn't matter. Like the UVXY right now is what? Four, 480, $5, something like that. Um, doesn't matter. It's totally decoupled from whatever the VIX futures are. But the relative changes is what you're looking for. So don't be confused by that. It, it directly tracks its underlying index, not the price, the movements. Hopefully that made some sense. That's kind of a tough thing to explain, but you unpacked a whole bunch of things there. So I like that question. All right, looks like the last one. You are comparing the performance against a classic 60-40 portfolio. I know you're not comparing it against the SPY total return because you consider that 60-40 better reflects what people have. True, like I just said previously, no rational investor can watch their net worth crash 50% and just go to sleep that night. It doesn't work that way. I know that if you look at a long-term chart, sometimes it appears like if we look at a long-term chart of the S&P 500, you might be tempted to think, oh, it's, it's totally no problem. Like all I really have to do is just hang on for the ride, right? Yeah, this would have been uncomfortable, but look at all this. What is going on? It's trying to find the dates. You might think, oh, well, this is crazy, right? But I'll, all I have to do is just hang on for the ride and I'll actually make my money back. But imagine what it's gonna feel like in real time right there. And this is only a 34% drawdown. Imagine the 56% in the financial crisis. Imagine the 86% going back all the way to the Great Depression. I mean, long time ago, but you get the point. So no rational investor can hold the S&P total return. That's why when I'm showing my performance, yeah, I, I do like to show my performance against a 60-40. I think it's much more accurate to say, look, the vast majority of the investment world is in something that largely mirrors the performance of a 60-40. They might think it's complicated. Like you might think, oh no, it's not true. I've got domestic and international stocks. I've got emerging markets and real estate and utilities. And I've got all these things, commodities. What you'll find is a lot of those things are highly correlated to a 60-40. So even though it sounds different and it looks more complicated, essentially the performance will track a 60-40. So that's why I do it. The S&P, sure, I could add a line. It's as simple as just adding a line. But what I think a benchmark is, is legitimately giving people two choices. You can either do this or you can do this. That's what a benchmark is. And in my opinion, since nobody does the 100% stocks, why even show that, right? Why I'm trying to present my work, this is VTS. This is a 60-40 that 90% of the investment world follows. Which one do you want? You can do both. Which one do you want? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be showing somebody something that nobody should be doing that. I mean, who, oh, I've got another chart here that reminds me. Um, you have no idea how bad the future is going to get, right? You're, you're looking hindsight during a really long 12-year bull market. But look at the performance here, inflation adjusted of the three indexes. So we've got the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ. Depending on the time frame, I mean, most people started investing here, so they think everything's fine. But what you're forgetting is it was only 20 years ago where the S&P 500 was in a inflation-adjusted drawdown for 17 years. How would you feel if your net worth, first of all, drew down that much, like 60%, depending on which index you have, and then you had to wait 17 years to recover your money? Obviously, recency bias is making people think like, oh, this isn't that bad. Look, at COVID was terrible, but the market bounced the next month. I mean, we only had to wait until April, and all of a sudden the market is bouncing again. Well, I mean, slow down, people. That's not typically how the stock market works. The Fed had to spend $8 trillion to make that happen. The government had to do insane measures to make sure that that happened. Don't be so sure that we're not going to set up here for a 
10 to 15 year drawdown in the stock market. Who knows? But I personally don't think any rational investor makes that decision. I mean, look, if you want to do it, I'm not the person to tell you you're wrong, but boy, you, I mean, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I don't have any enemies, but you know, mm -mm. so like I said, I could add a, a, any benchmark you want to look at. That's fine, but it would be totally irrelevant because I mean, who does that? It's crazy. And don't forget, like, I mean, again, we're going back in history. It's a long time ago, but from the, after the, you know, the 1929 Great Depression crash, uh, the S&P 500 took 26 years to recover. It was in a drawdown for 26 years. That's pretty much an investing time horizon, right? That's way too long. And if you're approaching anything close to retirement, yeah, you're going to capitulate. You're going to do the absolute worst thing possible. You're going to ride it as low and as, you know, until you just can't sleep anymore and then you're gonna sell, and that's what's gonna happen. So I would just recommend people know ahead of time, look, emotions during a drawdown is way more real and visceral than looking at it on a 20-year chart and saying, oh, I, I totally would have just held on, and look at all that performance afterwards. Would you have? Like, what if you have a wife and kids and you're down 50%? That's a little bit different than looking at a 20-year chart and saying, I would have held on. I don't think you would have. I don't think any rational investor would have. So that's how I would answer that question. Let me see if I finished all these off. Took a while, but I think those were awesome questions. So um, yeah, I got it all. Good job. That only took 57 minutes. All right, people. We've got three minutes. Open Q&A. Here we go. I'm just kidding. I totally butchered the time frame, so I'll stay a little longer. Like I said, I ran more than a half marathon like two hours ago, so I'm a, I'm a little sleepy right now. But um, I, I like to run, so it's, it's okay. Sometimes I like getting lost. I did that in Vancouver once too. I showed you that map. I actually went across the Granville Bridge. It's that bridge that I showed you. And I just kept going that way towards what's called Kitsilano. And, uh, you know, get back to the house and look at the... GPS and think, oh my God, I just ran 30 kilometers. That was a little more than I thought I was going to do, but it is what it is. So here we go. Here we go. I watch all of your live streams after they air. Awesome. I recognize this name. Oh yeah, this is Darty. Yeah. Uh, but I'm checking in live for the first time for a bit. Awesome. Yeah. I remember you've emailed me several times saying that you can never watch it live, but Okay. With your frequent moves, will you ever get your Corvette? Um, so as everybody knows, I'm a huge Corvette fan. I had the previous model and I loved it and um, had to sell it because I move around a lot. So honestly, I, I will get it. Of course I will get it. And I will probably get the new E-Ray if you've been following the Corvette world. The new E-Ray is just absolutely sick. It's just front you know, the 200 horsepower electric engine in the front with a 500 horsepower gas powered V8 in the back. I mean, come on, come on people. So I'm definitely getting the E-Ray. Problem is the countries that I'm in. So I live in Taiwan for a good six months a year. Absolutely, I would never get a sports car in Taiwan. It totally defeats the purpose. Traffic is ridiculous. The air quality is bad. I want the, uh, the convertible. Um, no, it's never gonna happen in Taiwan. So. Vancouver is good, but I don't like Vancouver because, um, you know, taxes, of course. I prefer to be in Dubai. But uh, Vancouver would be awesome. But I don't know if I'll be back there for the next few years. And so that really just leaves Dubai. Am I going to actually go and get one? I'm only here for maybe, I don't know, if hopefully my wife wants to sleep. So when I say this number, she's not shocked. But uh, I'll probably be in Dubai for like four to five months a year going forward. Um, I joined the golf course, Emirates Golf Club, just down the street. So it's pretty cool here. I like it. Obviously, tax-free is pretty sweet. Might get a Corvette here, but probably next year, maybe two years. I'm kind of like, I could do it. I could just go out and buy the stupid thing, but I don't know if you've seen the prices. It's pretty bad. I have this rule, and I've always followed my rules, right? Even if I could break it financially, like I'm in a little bit better financial situation now than when I instituted this rule in the past, but I typically only buy vehicles three to four years used, and that's just what I do. So I just wait for the model to be about three to four years older, go out and pick one up like that. You can just kill about 40% of the depreciation curve. 
like I said, I, I don't know. I suppose if I really wanted to, I could break that rule. But as I always say with the trading, bad things happen when you break your rules. So I'm not going to break that rule. The E-Ray comes out this year. I'll probably get one in 2025. I think probably that's the time frame. And I'll do it in Dubai because literally today I'm out walking. Like I just walked out to the subway to get a sandwich. I saw a Bugatti Devo. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's probably $10 million car. It's not just a Bugatti Chiron. It's the Devo version. I don't know how many there are in the world, 40, something like that. So I saw that and then I went down to buy some dates. Uh, Dubai's awesome for the dates. And this uh, Porsche 918 Spider pulls up right out front, which is my ultimate dream car. Obviously I can't afford a $1.3 million car, but saw that and then Ferraris. And then there was this like Lamborghini group down the street. You see those like everywhere. I see 10 a day here. Uh, it's a pretty crazy city for cars. So if I ever do get my Corvette, it'll be here for sure in Dubai. And I'll look like a, just a brokey, you know, driving around in a Corvette E-Ray. I mean, what kind of broke, no job person has a Corvette E-Ray in Dubai? Um, just kidding. It's a nice car. But you, sometimes you feel pretty poor here. It's, it's a ridiculous city. All right. I see a lot of short covering started in VX Futures since yesterday. Do you, but like I said, the short covering, unless you're in the room with those traders, you don't really know if it's just you know, recycling for the future or switching their strategy that it's the same net exposure, but it's a different function. Like you can hedge with S and P futures. You can hedge with options, VIX options, who knows? I, I don't ever try to guess people's exposure based on the pricing in the market. I just assume, okay, let's just stick to the numbers. Clearly volatility is going to be a little bit stickier going forward. It's crushed for two months straight. It's going to be a little bit harder to keep going down. I think just diminishing return wise, it, it kind of makes sense. Okay, sorry I just joined you if you already mentioned it. VIX seems very low and seems like it should not be so low. Is it too low? If yes, what is going on? Is the VIX too low? So the average VIX, the mean, right? The mean is just you average up all the numbers and you divide by how many there are. It's about 1950. And the VIX right now is about 1950. Let's actually check exactly what it is. The VIX right now could be exactly on the mean. Um, 19. So actually the VIX is only up 1% today, even though the S&P is down 1%. So that's interesting. It's a little bit sticky today. Typically it'll be about a 6% difference. So if the S&P is up or down 1%, you could expect the VIX more or less to be up six. It's only 70% correlated to the stock market. So don't think that that's some type of one-to-one -one ratio, but, um, is it low? 19 VIX? It's about average. I would say it's actually really high right now. Uh, if you think about it, the mean VIX is 1950. The median, dead center middle number, if you rank them all in order, the median is about 1750. It's about 1742, actually. And then the mode, the mode is the most frequently occurring value in a series of numbers. The mode of the VIX is 12. So, you know, the VIX does like to spend time in the low teens spends an awful lot of time with an 11, 12, 13 handle. So you could make a case that, look, the market's been ugly for all of 2022. There has to be some hedging exhaustion going on. And the fact that it's still at the mean, I mean, would it shock me if it jumped back into the 20s and went to 25 or 30? Not at all. I mean, of course not. The, the economy doesn't seem strong to me, even though there's a lot of people who are just buying. It's a strong rally. But would it surprise me if the VIX just kept going down to 15, 16? Not really. I mean, remember the VIX, I've actually got a video. There's a video for everything, obviously. I've been doing a lot of videos. But um, if you, maybe I can even call it up with average VIX. Yeah, what is the average VIX? This one right here. Again, this is going to make me reminiscent of Vancouver for sure. Um, yeah, go on. But the average VIX, like I said, here you've got the median, 1744, middle number. You've got the mean. This is what I was talking about. This is the mode of the VIX. The mode is all the way over here. So clearly the VIX does like to spend an awful lot of time down here, even though you could make a case that, yeah, maybe the dead average is somewhere over here. 
it's actually kind of over here. So when the VIX is at 1950, that's high. That's considered, it, it's not going to stay there for very long. Remember what the VIX means. It is essentially just a forward estimation of what the S&P 500 will be doing. So when you've got a VIX of 16, essentially that means that the S&P 500 should still be moving about 1% up or down on average, like within one standard deviation. So you just divide by the square root of 252 trading days, and you've essentially got movement that doesn't really match up with what we're doing right now. The market isn't moving enough to justify a 20 VIX. So if the market continues doing what it's doing for very much longer, don't be surprised at all if it continues downward. The, the, the S&P 500 always has a burden of proof to continue to prove that high, high volatility is justified. If it doesn't continue with those one up, two down, one up, one up, one down, you know, if, it, if that doesn't continue, then no reason why the VIX would stay at 20. Somebody's laughing at Hastings. Yeah, Hastings is just, uh, you know, like when I'm running, you got your head on a swivel there. It's about five blocks that I have to go through. And, um, you know, keep your head down. Don't look at anybody in the eye. All, all the standard big city rules apply there. But, you know, in, in roughly 17 kilometer running path, that's easily the fastest period for me. I mean, I'm, I'm running. I'm not jogging through that Hastings. I am head down running. And then uh, once I hit that nice hotel, I can take a breather and, okay, I made it one more day. I, I don't like to talk that way too, because I'm, I'm actually, I, I hate that. I hate that homeless problem. I, I just think that it's, it's so sad that a country with ridiculously high tax rates can't figure out how to treat people who are obviously struggling. Canada can't figure out how to you know, give some of that 57% tax bracket money to these people who clearly need it. I mean, what are we doing? We got, literally, if you've been to Hastings Street in Vancouver, this is, again, this is not a very nice thing to say, but people literally, it, it's a tourist attraction. If you've gone to Vancouver before, you'll go see, you know, all the tourist sites, and then you'll probably want, somebody will say, hey, you should go check out Hastings Street. It's like nothing you've ever seen. It's crazy down there. It's like, 10 city blocks of the worst living conditions you can imagine. And this is in Vancouver, like Hastings Street, that sketchy area is a less than a five minute run for me to some of the wealthiest areas in Vancouver. Like I lived in Coal Harbor, which is really big mega million dollar homes down there, apartments mostly, but beautiful area to live five minute walk down the street is the worst thing you can imagine. Like how do people even live there? I don't even know. And I am just completely angry with Canada for not being able to solve this problem. I mean, if need be throw some money at the problem, but at, at the very least help people. It's just, we just kind of, we just know it's there and we just don't do anything. We just, okay, well they'll just, you know, police don't really go there and I guess they'll fend for themselves. That's kind of, it, it's weird. Like Canada has a reputation of being a compassionate place, but go to Hastings Street and then tell me that Canada, you know, tell me that Justin Trudeau and the Canadian government, the British Columbia government actually really cares about collecting ridiculously high tax dollars and then doing nothing positive with it. It's just, uh, it's brutal. But as far as protecting yourself, like, you can have compassion for these problems in the world and also make sure you understand that while it's maybe not their fault and they definitely are struggling, that doesn't mean that you can just, you know, assume that everything's fine. You gotta, you gotta protect yourself. It's Vancouver is not a safe place to be at all. Um, it's one of the, another, I mean, a million benefits to living in Dubai, of course, in Taiwan, especially Taiwan and Dubai, probably two of the safest places I've ever been in my life. Like, I don't own a million dollar watch, but if I did, I could go out right now. It's like 11 at night. I could put on a million dollar watch and go walk anywhere within 10 miles of my house. I wouldn't even, it wouldn't even occur to me that somebody's going to take my watch. There is no crime here. None at all. And Taiwan's kind of the same. Like my wife can go out walking at midnight. It doesn't really matter. Like I'd prefer she doesn't because I'm Canadian and I know what can happen, but 
it, it just, you, you can't believe the difference in safety when you live in a big city like Vancouver or, you know, LA, New York, Chicago, these places compared to Taiwan, Tokyo, Dubai. Uh, it's just, it's just night and day. You can't even believe it. Um, sad, sad, sad. Hastings Street. Go take a peek if you're ever interested, but uh, head on a swivel down there. What are you using to do those types of back tests, like shorting when vol elevated? Just good old school back testing, Excel. I'm old school. I like to do it that way. So when you see me talking about, oh, I've run this test where I'll do like, you know, a back test of this strategy, what would happen if my VRP, you skip 13 or 12.4% of trading days, what would it look like? I did this with Excel, right? The reason that I do that, a lot of people say, oh, you know, there's this really cool software that you can do it. A, doesn't often apply to volatility metrics. Like the things that I'm tracking aren't readily available on those back testing softwares. Like if you're doing just basic, you know, moving averages and stock market indicators, maybe MACD and all that, you know, basic stuff, but we're doing volatility specific and it's quite rare to find those. But the second reason is when I'm doing my back test, it might take a while. I might need a coffee. I might need an hour to do it, but I will learn more in that hour and I will get more ideas for future testing than just punching it into a back testing software and saying, oh, look at that, it's 14%. I will learn way more going through the long drawn out Excel way of doing a back test. A lot of other people say, well, how come you don't automate all your data? Like you can just download it straight from the website right into your spreadsheet. Because every day I spend about 30 minutes just inputting data into my spreadsheet so that my trading strategies spit out like what the trade signal for the day is. I could automate that and have it done in two minutes, but that part of my day, that 30 minutes of data input, I also get a blank piece of, not a piece of paper, but you know, a note on my computer to write things down. And because I'm manually inputting the data, I'm noticing patterns. I'm seeing things happen in front of me. I'm saying, well, that's interesting. I remember two days ago, these data points were correlated and now they're not. What's that all about? So I'll make a little note. Hey, check out that VRP. How come it didn't go up two days ago? And I'll notice these things. But if I have this automated software that just puts it into my spreadsheet for me and just boom, there it is, I didn't look at any of those data sets. So I didn't learn anything. Didn't ask any follow-up questions. Didn't do any further research. Didn't have any ideas. So for me, I probably do spend a good hour-ish, maybe some days, two hours a day, doing back testing, doing data input, doing, you know, trying to develop things. But that's what keeps me on my toes. That's what makes me the trader that I am and gives me the edge. If I try to automate and shortcut everything, well, I will very quickly delve into the realm of being average, right? I don't want to be average. I want to notice every little thing that's happening in front of me. So that's one of the things I just, yeah, excel old, good old Excel. And I'm not even very good at Excel. Like I'm, I have a math degree, but I, I haven't used it for any specific purpose. I just, uh, I don't have any really brilliant Excel skills. I just make it work for me. I'm probably no better at Excel than you are. I just, I like doing things manually. That's how I've always done it. And that's how you'll know that, look, in the future, <laughs> heads up for all the chat GPT people, um, my work will always be written by me. I do not care that there is an AI that can do most of it for me. I don't care. I do everything manually. I do everything in my own brain. And there is no chance that I will ever let any AI, no matter how good it can replicate and sound like me, nothing you see will ever be done by AI. I can guarantee you that. And none of my strategies will ever be done based on backtesting softwares that just spit out an answer. Like... Yeah, I could get, download a backtesting software and say, well, what happens if you sell a, you know, 30 delta put option, 30 days out, you sell it 10 days out, go. It'll give me the answer, but I learn nothing getting that answer. The process of going from A to Z is directly jumped over all that good stuff in the middle. So no, I don't, I don't do that. I, I don't care if it takes an extra hour. I'm uh, old school manual all the way, always will be.
when did this happen? When did you ask this question? What is up with this market reversal? What market reversal? I don't know. I don't see a market reversal at all. Um, I, I would say, like, if you mean in general, like down 1%, just, I mean, that's a strong up move. You have to expect there's going to be a couple of down days. Um, what happened intraday? Yeah, not much. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe we have different time frames that we trade on and invest on. I'm more of like a day-to-day -day person. I look at the data an hour after the market's open. I input all my stuff. Takes about 30 minutes. And then trades are done. And I'm done for the day. That's it. I don't sit in front of my computer for eight hours. I'm not one of those people. Perhaps you're a different time frame investor and there's something you're, you're missing there. Okay. How long? Again, I am so, so terrible at managing time. Enjoy your work. Be well. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Are there any capacity limits with any of the strategies on the portfolio? That's a good question. I mean, could we put to work 10, 10 or a million and compounding? Good question. Um, I would say in general, no limits at all. No, but perhaps on the option side. So this is our portfolio right now. It's five strategies, 20% each. Of course, for three of them, these are just ETFs and they're large ETFs. You could put, I mean, you're not going to max it out based on your own portfolio. This is the NASDAQ, the 20-year treasuries, utilities ETF. These are major. I mean, there's no chance that anything that we do is going to affect that. You could make a case that this is a little bit lower volume, but still, our portfolio is about 20%. I've tried to add up like what I, my honest assessment of how much capital is running through my strategies. If I really had to ballpark it, I typically arrive at a number that's, I, I would probably say two to 300 million is what I would suspect our community is, if, if I had to guess. But I've also had people who have emailed me just crazy high dollar amounts that they're trading with. And we've had to actually work a few things like iron condors, for example. If you're using the SPY, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to open 200 contracts of the SPY. So you can just flip it to the SPX and you can just use that and it's 10 times notional and you can open 20 contracts. 20 iron condors on SPX, given that this is only a 3% allocation of the portfolio, I don't think you're going to max out anything. You'd have to be just so wealthy to be able to max it out. But the reason that I can't actually say is because I also do work with a few, you know, family offices and hedge funds and whatnot, and they do actually pay me for consulting and then also trade my strategies. But my deal with them is basically, I can't say who it is. I mean, some of them, you would have heard of them, but I also don't really know how they're, what capacity they're using all my strategies. I can get an idea, but they don't tell me. Like they don't say, well, our total assets under management is 700 million and we're putting 20% into yours. Nobody tells me those numbers. So I'm kind of guessing when I do this, but I'd say we're probably, they're probably in the two to 300 million range, which I don't think is getting even remotely close to maxing it out. The only one you could say is the vol trend strategy for the options. UVXY, yeah, you're gonna have probably a little bit of problems pushing let's say you're trying to push 10 million through this. Yeah, you, you might have some issues there. Um, but not fortunately, it's just, it is what it is. It's an option strategy. This is selling butterfly or buying butterflies on the UVXY. A lot of the VTS community doesn't trade this strategy. So if people skip the options, they can just do a combination of the three tactical and that will never max out the capital. And then also the hedge funds and offices that I work with, they also don't use this strategy. So this is sort of like, let's say half of the VTS community uses this strategy and none of the other large firms that I have do it. I don't think we're maxing out and I've never noticed anything. I always get my trades done with no problems at all. I don't think it's an issue. What's this? LA, Sacramento, Bay Area, Portland, Seattle, all have major homeless growing with people crossing borders every day, thinking to live in India or Dubai. 
India cost of living is a thousand to two thousand. Yeah, well, if you have the choice, like I'm not, I, I never recommend, like I don't advertise the fact that, you know, I happen to think Dubai is better than living in, in Western countries because maybe you've got family, maybe your kids are in school in Portland and you just have to do the best you can. I don't know. I, I would never say, oh, you're crazy to, to live in Portland. What, why don't you come to Dubai? It's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible for me. Look at my lifestyle. I'm a digital nomad for forever. I was a professional golfer, basically a digital nomad for years. I've been doing this for 25 years, moving around the world, living in different cities, picking up here and going there. Plus I'm a minimalist, like quite literally, people think I'm you know, joking when I say this, all of my personal belongings fit in three suitcases. Two suitcases plus that golf bag you see behind me. That's all I own in this world. Nothing else. I can pick up, I could leave this, everything I own is in this apartment, this Airbnb. I could pick up and move my whole life in an hour. Give me one hour and I can literally move countries. So yeah, I'm in a different situation than most people. My wife certainly couldn't do that. It would take us months to pack up her stuff. But you know, I can just give, give me 45 minutes, I'll, I'll be able to pack it up and leave. So yeah, if, if you have the choice and, and the, you know, the social problems and the crime rates and the, you know, the wokeness and all the things that are plaguing the, currently the Western countries, if that is a problem for you, plus the rising tax rates, then yeah, do a cost benefit analysis and maybe consider moving. Um, I, I know Dubai is incredibly easy to get into right now. It might not always be the case, but right now it's, it was, it was a breeze to get in. And if anybody's curious, you don't have to buy a Bugatti. Like it's not the law that you have to come here and drive a Rolls Royce. It's actually not a very expensive place to live at all. In fact, like ho housing is very cheap here. This apartment is quite nice. Like I'd have to say it's quite nice. If this apartment was in Coal Harbor, Vancouver, where I used to live, the, the house I used to live in Vancouver was over $2 million. It's not nicer than this place. This place is about 400,000 US dollars. That was over 2 million. They're the same house, the same two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. That's the difference it makes. Like you can get, if you have half a million dollars for a home, I mean, you can get an ocean view, beautiful place, you know, like, Five, it feels like a five-star hotel, like everything's made of marble and it's just, it's really, really, housing's cheap. Cars are normal price. Like there's no markup, there's no nothing. Gas is super cheap, food is cheap here. But then there's also seven-star hotels. There's also like, if you want to join the Ferrari club, yeah, you're gonna have to spend money for that. Dubai is a place where you could live a totally normal life like I do. I'm a minimalist, I love it here. I don't spend money like that. Or you could, you could max out a million dollar a month salary and think you're poor. Like it's, everything is available here. If you want to spend a million bucks, it's not hard. But you can also live a very, very good life tax-free for three grand a month. I mean, my golf membership is, that's a beautiful golf course. I, I not only get that course, I get five 18 hole courses with my membership, plus 200 courses around the world that I can play, reciprocals, $700 a month. Like it's really not that much money. So, um, yeah. The world is open. This idea that people have that you have to live in the country you were born in, it's 2023, people. If you don't like where you live and you think you will have a better lifestyle elsewhere, you would have better business and work opportunities elsewhere. You'd have a safer living community. Maybe your kids, like Dubai is, my wife will even attest to this, but anybody who's been here, I don't think there's a better place on earth to raise children. Like it's just, it's the most child-friendly place I've ever been to. There's family, everything here. Everything is geared towards children and they let their kids get away with stuff here. Like nobody stops their kids from doing anything. It's crazy. I'll be at Starbucks and just like kids will come up and just start talking to you and they're they're riding bicycles inside Starbucks. Nobody says anything. Like it's... Kids, kids rule here. Like it would be awesome to be a fam raise a family here. It's, it's not what people think. People think that it's, you know, it's got this terrible image. It's the Middle East. It's so conservative. It's, it's not, it's absolutely not. Listen to me. I sound like a, I sound like I work with the Dubai Tourism Bureau or something, but cool place. Take my word for it. It's, uh, 
It's worth checking out for sure. All right. Uh oh. I got everybody started because I talked about Hastings, the nightmare. I deliver needles there for 20 years. The area is a nightmare. It's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And it makes me embarrassed to be a Canadian that they're like Venezuela. I've been to Colombia. I've been to, you know, a lot of places. I've traveled the world. Hastings Street is up there with the worst thing I saw in Venezuela. It's really bad. And when I went to Venezuela, there were student protests and like bombings and yeah, that's Hastings, pretty much. Hastings Street, downtown Vancouver, like five blocks away from Coal Harbor where the millionaires live. It's, it's out of this world crazy. That's Canada. Good old Canada. Reputation for, I mean, if Canada was only, if Canada was half as good as its reputation is globally, it'd be a phenomenal country to live in. But any Canadian will tell you that when the, when the globe, and I'm Canadian, so I can hack on my own country here. But when the, the rest of the world talks about how amazing Canada is, and we've got this incredible medical system, and really? Canada's medical system's good? I, I don't know about that. Like, Taiwan is a million times better. Not to be a Dubai tourism, you know, fanboy, but Dubai medical is way better. Like, there's a hundred countries in the world that's better medical system than Canada. We pay a lot of taxes and it's just, I mean, it's hard to beat the scenery. As far as how well it's managed, like the bureaucracy in Canada is out of this, it's just out of control. So I wish Canada was half as good as the reputation we have globally because uh, everybody thinks Canada is this incredible, like, utopia place. I don't know. It's got its advantages, but it's also, um, it's hurting and it's going in the wrong direction. Being a digital nomad, I take it you haven't cooked your own meals in years. Um, I cook one meal a day every day, and I eat out one meal a day every day. So I eat twice a day. Um, typically, I'll eat out lunch and cook my own dinner. So today I cooked fish, chicken, and poached eggs on toast. That was what I took, cooked for dinner. So, yeah, I cook every day. I like to be healthy and, um, you know, cooking at home, it, you can manage the ingredients more and the calories are lower. So I always try to cook. Airbnbs are always fully stocked. Hotels, I always try to stay at one that has, you know, the, the, the stuff that you can actually live a normal life. Costs a little more, but it's worth it. All right. That was too long. That was a long live stream. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty tired. I'm old. I'm 47 years old. Running 22 kilometers isn't, isn't as easy as it used to be for me. So I got to get some sleep. Thanks, everybody. Um, great questions today. Thank you very much. I will chop them up and put some of those in clips. Throw that on the clips channel just for people who are still kind of milling around here. Uh, just in case you're here still. Here is the clips channel. Oh, you know what? I can't even drop it in the chat because I closed the chat. Forget about it. We'll do it next week. But uh, you should subscribe to the Clips channel because that's where all those questions are going to be put on. All right. I'm going to bed for sure. So see you next week, next Friday. Thanks, everyone.